This week on the podcast, we have the amazing Kate Stewart. Kate was a great guest. She's an experienced businesswoman with a lot of energy and a lot of interesting stories. You've got to take risks, like literally always take risks. Mm -hmm. A lot of my success has come from being streetwise. She's operated in several different industries from running the Liverpool Heritage Markets and attracting Hollywood film productions like the filming of Captain America and Sherlock Holmes. When it's yourself, I don't think that we give ourselves enough credit yeah. and we don't pass ourselves on the back. As an entrepreneur, you literally don't know what you're going to get up to the next day. Yeah. Um, some days are good, some days are bad, some days are terrible. The amount of children that don't respond to the education programme is just yeah. phenomenal. Don't ever let anyone see your weaknesses. Look, I'll take everything off me tomorrow and I know I can not make money again. I just can't. I will never go in a room and let someone know I don't know what I'm talking about. Fake it till you make it. <laughs> Kate, thanks so much for coming on. I'm Thank sorry, I'm sorry someone sent you the wrong address. It wasn't me. Left me in the cold, freezing, vulnerable. We got you a brew. <laughs> You've got Man Manchester much? Um, you have some of my friends live down here, yeah. So while I was here, I just called in and my Botox done on the way. <laughs> Saved me a trip. Nice. And um what, what, what do you think about Manchester compared to like Liverpool? Do you know what? I feel, I feel like, like... a bit of like competition between the two cities. Yeah, and it's so silly as well because we're, we're neighbours. Yeah. You know, we've got the same northern, you know, souls in us. And it's just football's made this massive rivalry. That's mm. not really there. We should be working together to make northern powerhouses instead of listening to stupid men chant about fucking <laughs> football. But that's the same with everything. Like, there's always competition with your neighbour. Even in football, all the rivalries are, are neighbours. Where it's like, it's kind of weird, isn't it? Like, you're actually... Yeah, but I know if you strip it all back, and yeah. like, I mean, that you have rivalry, you, you know, someone's rival when you're young. At 41, Kevin, I don't see anyone <laughs> as my rival. Yeah. I see things that complement each other. Mm -hmm. um, and if you look in business districts as well, you'll have, you know, all the jewelers together. You have all the travel agents together and stuff because people, they do complement each other. Yeah. You, you go in between. If people are going for something, they know where to go. So yeah, I don't see anyone as my rival. I see, I see them as complementing me and I like to work together with people and I like collaborating. Yeah. There's enough of the pie to go round. You don't have to be a greedy and eat it all yourself. If everyone has a slice, everyone's belly is full and we all do well. Yeah. Well, that's something I picked up on you when I was like researching you and looking at what you do. And uh, so obviously the sisterhood HQ um, that, that you started, that was kind of what it was about, right? Bringing women together, trying maybe not to compete with each other, bring them together, doing a bit of a community where you can kind of lift each other up. Is that kind of the purpose? So I that? think I, I still to this day, it's still hard being a woman in business. I don't care what you say. Men have got it so much easier. I look at my partner and, you know, they're all rallying around, they're all passing deals around each other. Mm. And you just don't see that in the female business yeah. network. So I wanted to bring people together because fundamentally there is a lot of, you know, jealousy amongst women sometimes. And, you know, she's doing better than me. She's got the best handbag or she's done, da, da, da. it's like, stop the bullshit, mm. you know, stop it and let's all come together, work together and help each other grow. I think sometimes people are scared as well that someone's going to be elevated above them and they're going to get left behind. Yeah. But it's not that. It's if you are elevated, put your hand back down and pull other women up and let's work together as a team and stop being rivals. Mm -hmm. Do you, you see that way more in women than men? Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you see men as competition then or not? Absolutely not. Kidding, aren't you? Never. No, yeah, no. So that, that is in, not as in like competition as in no, they're better what? as in. Even like to this day, men. Still trying to have the kegs, kegs off women. I I deal in property, so I'll have yeah. builders coming in and they start talking in all fancy terms, thinking I'm an absolute gobshite. And they'll go like, I know how much the job is. Say it's 20 grand. They'll come in, oh, it's a bit, bit more worth that girl. <laughs> you know, it's 40 grand. It's like, well, it's clearly not your gobshite. So you're not getting the job anyway. But yeah. they do still try and have the kegs off, yeah. And sometimes I don't understand. There'll be like terms for like, I don't know. For something about putting joists in or we've got to get mm -hmm. RSJs in and blah, 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 blah. And I'm just like, okay, okay. I said, so can you write all that down for me and I'll take it away. Yeah. And then I'll go and research it all and then go back and buzz off them. But yeah, men still try and take the piss out of women in business. So how, how do you combat that? Knowing that. So every time you walk into a room, for example, and like a builder, for example, you you have that in your mind, right? There's probably a good chance they're going to try to take the piss. Yeah. So how, how do you combat that? What, what do you do? So I'll go in, or like I've just said, and if I don't understand something, I'll say, okay, can you write all that down for me, please, so I can go away and study it. 
And I will go away and research the fuck yeah. out of it and go back and say, well, no, you're wrong on this, you're wrong on that, and you're wrong on that. It's not all the time, but you know, mm. you do still get it. But is there anything you, you do like prior to that? Like maybe like as a persona type thing? Oh, I'm a bitch. Oh, yeah, I'll yeah, just yeah, go yeah. in. I'm coming quite cold. Very cold. <laughs> I, I mean, everyone says I'm cold anyway. I'm like the ice queen. Um, always, and I've been in meetings and like had set meetings up with builders and my business manager worked with me for many, many years and he was in his 60s and he always wore a shirt and tie and, you know, very, very prim, proper and posh. And we, I'd just bounce around like this and mm. we'd go into meetings and everyone would be up his ass and ignore me thinking I was the PA. So I'd just sit there and get my <laughs> hands fucking crack on. And they'd all be like, yeah, so come on, nice to meet you, sir. And blah, 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 do you want tea? Didn't even offer me a fucking drink. So I'd just sit there and go, okay. And then when the meeting starts, I'd go, well, you all finished now. Okay, so I'm the managing director. And you can see the faces yeah, like, yeah, yeah. oh, shit. I'd say, and by the way, I'm not working with you now for that. And I'd get up and walk out because there's always someone to replace someone. Everything's replaceable. You don't have to work with one company. There's always, so as you said, mm. there's always somebody else to do it. So purposely, I'd, I'd walk out and say, I'm not working with you for that. Is that quite common? Does that happen a lot? Not too much now because everyone knows I'm a bitch. Right. So it's, um, it's eased a little bit. But get used to, yeah. Mm. When women walk in with a, with a man or something, you know, they do f- flock to the man, especially yeah. when you work in, in male dominated areas. Mm. What about advantage? Advantages? Is there many being a woman in business? There's loads. I mean, what do you say they are? We're, we're multitaskers better. We do, women do multitask better. Um, we're prob- fantastic problem solvers. Um, there's so many advantages to being a woman as well. Like, I have used the the little soft me girl a few times. Like, do you know what I mean? <laughs> I think probably in the past I've shoved my boobs out a few times to get what I wanted, <laughs> if I'm totally honest. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, well, do you know, we'll, go, we'll go a bit through, like, um, your background just to get a bit of insight into how things were for you back then, how you kind of got to where you are now, kind of, you know, taken through your journey. So um, going back into, like, maybe school times, how, how was that for you? I just didn't respond well with the education system. It bored me. So I'd be sitting there and the teacher would just be standing, droning on and on and on. Yeah. Algebra. When am I ever going to fucking use algebra? So my mind would just go somewhere else and then I'd start messing around. Mm. So it's not like throwing things at people and then I'd get throughout the class and I'd end up going to stand the bushes and smoking like 20 ciggies. So in the end, they just were just like, we don't know what to do with you. Um, so I was like, I'm not going anymore. And I went and I got a job as a chambermaid in a hotel. So scrubbing toilets from an early age. Was but, that better, better than school for you? Absolutely, yeah. Because, yeah. I, I mean, I think at the time I got £2 an hour. But that £2 an hour was worth so much more to me than sitting listening to someone drone on about like... £2, a, that's crazy. Yeah. I'm Jeez. old. I'm old. Um, <laughs> yeah, but that was worth so much more to me. I'd worked yeah. from an early age. I worked from when I was 13 on a burger van in Matthew Street outside the world-famous Cavern Club. And I used to work there till four o'clock in the morning. From 13? Yeah. So you wasn't in school at all at that point? I was in school, Are you yeah. still in school? So I'd be on there till four o'clock in the morning okay. and I would go home, have an hour's sleep, get up and go to school. <laughs> um, and they've made a programme about it when I was, I'd done like one of the first realities. Yeah, I've seen a few clips. Yeah. And... They, they done this program about it and these clips just resurfaced and it's like, oh, fuck off. It's like the thing that I'll never, like Russell Brand has yeah. around Honda life. It's just like, oh, go away. I'm all yeah. classy and everything now. <laughs> but yeah, I've always had an amazing work ethic. I've always wanted to earn money. Mm. And I, my family didn't have loads of money. They'd give me the best that they could, but they couldn't afford, afford everything that I wanted. And I was like, well, I'll go out and get it myself. Yeah. Do you know, I feel like I repeat myself every single time this comes up because I think like 90 to 95% of guests I've had, really, obviously really successful in business, all struggled at school. They ever left early. They didn't like it. They just didn't feel like they were good at it, which is pretty crazy. Why, why do you think that is? Your reason for that? Because we, we work off a format that's been around for, what, 100 years. Mm. It's a, somebody standing at the front of a class dictating to you what they want you to learn. And not everybody learns in the same way. And I actually yeah. done this. I went back to school and done a program a couple of years ago called Secret Teacher on Channel 4. Mm. And I went undercover as a teaching assistant. 
And the amount of children that don't respond to the education program is just yeah. phenomenal. I've seen that. You hired someone, didn't you? You hired one yeah. of your students that, yeah. that was in there. So what, what, what did you kind of figure about it? Well, it was strange going back into a classroom after so long and yeah. actually seeing the teacher side of it as well because we used to like, I think we locked our teachers in cupboards and everything and we were like really <laughs> evil to them. Yeah. But seeing that they are given that curriculum, they are told that's what you've got to do. And some of them don't agree with it themselves. They're saying, you know, everyone's different. We all learn in different ways. So I did feel a bit our ass on them. Um, and it was an eye-opener as well to see the struggles that children have got. There's so many different influences in within schools and it was really, really you tough. Mean, like, troubles, troubles in their personal life or at school? Personal life and at school, mm. I mean... You know, there was fights breaking out. I was like, oh shit, what am I breaking kids off from bullying each other? And yeah. um and also, you know, there was I think there was 13 different languages spoken at the school as well. Right. So some te- kids had to have an interpreter with them. It was hard for the the teacher was saying it's hard for me to teach through a third person, and then still happened. One of the classes had like 40 odd children in. Right. Um and two tra- two classes have been amalgamated into one and had 60 in. It's just to me, it was just the whole thing's a waste of time. Yeah. It needs to change and it needs to change now because I know my son's got ADHD as well and he's clever. He's really, mm-hmm. really clever. His reading ability is fantastic, but he just can't sit still in the chair. Yeah. Um, and even to this day, it's not it's not catered for. Mm-hmm. It's not catered for how but all our minds are different. Yeah. But did you feel like, because I know a lot of people feel like this as well, when they were younger, they were at school. They were, obviously, they were really clever and talented in different ways that don't necessarily show up in school. Yeah. So they felt like they weren't as valuable. They felt like they were behind when they weren't really, but they were just the way they were measured. Did you feel like that at school? Or did you know like this is kind of bullshit? No. They, and you're talented elsewhere. They used to say, she's good at everything, but she just will do care. it. Yeah, she just will not do it. I think I was a rebel as well. And I'm very streetwise. I mean, mm. a lot of my success has come from being streetwise. It's not from sitting and reading books about RA or algebra or yeah. formatting. It's like, yes, off. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's not practical in life. We don't need these things. I don't know why they make yeah. it and make our kids learn a load of bullshit that they're never going to use. So that was your mindset then? Yeah. So I think you, yeah. So that I, I think, think it's quite clever because at that age, you kind of just put like school and teachers on a pedestal. You feel like they're all right all the time. But the fact that you was like, no, this is like kind of irrelevant at that age. It's pretty, it's pretty clever. I know. I, I, I love history, by the way. It's like my, my little secret. And I remember sagging off school and getting the bus to Chester and going and learning about all the, the Romans being in Chester and stuff like that. So mm. something interested me. Then I would like really... I engage with it. Yeah. But just when if, I'm still the same to this day, if something bores me, like I nudge my PA in, in meetings and get my bored. <laughs> I'm bored. Like you've got to really engage yeah. me to keep me attention. Yeah. So then, how, how did you start slowly like moving in and navigating into business? So 17, I had a baby, and of me and the dad split up. I had this baby on my own. And it could have went two ways. You could have become another statistic, went mm-hmm. on to have more children and claim benefits and just stay on the same council estate where you're yeah. from. And I knew that wasn't for me. And I knew I had to do better for her because I didn't want to bring her up, having to fight her whole life mm-hmm. for anything. And so I went and trained as a beautician. And sometimes I'd still be waxing people's vaginas at 10 o'clock <laughs> in the night for about seven <laughs> quid. All but right. I did it yeah. because, you know, every penny helps. And I went into some beds. Um, as an employee? No. You started your own? Yeah. Okay. Um, And then as money come in, I was thinking, okay, I'm going back then. You could buy a house in Liverpool for five grand. Sure, yeah. It, they were just like prices. And then so I invested in property. And then this guy came up from London and he was starting the Camden of the North. Um. Mm-hmm at the heritage market and I went there and said can I have a job and he told me to fuck off and being me I went back again and was like can I have a job he was like no I went back again in the end he was like you can dress up as an elf in the grotto <laughs> thinking that I'd just leg it and yeah, I was you like, had good money you made a bit of money right through the through the beauty yeah but I knew I wanted it in and here I knew it was going to be something big okay 
Um, I was like, all right, fucking sign then. When I put the elf costume on, I stood there absolutely like you've just left me out in the cold. Then it was that. It was <laughs> James that, left you out in the that, cold. It was that kind of cold, and I was blue. And he was like, no, what for doing that? You've got balls, and right. I'll give you a job in the office. Four years, I owned it. How? Because he was an alcoholic, and he spent a lot of the time in hospital. Um, and I was pretty much running the show anyway. He owned it or he ran, he ran it? So we Managed operated it. the site. Um, okay. So the business was owned by him, but right. the site was owned by a company in oh, okay, got London. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so I ended up running the site and just learning from him. And just, you know, when you're thrown into the deep end, I love getting thrown in the deep end because that's how you learn to swim. Huge shout out to one of our sponsors, Say It With Diamonds, an amazing jewelry company founded by a friend of mine, Charlotte, who you might have seen previously on this podcast. Say It With Diamonds have brilliant collections for everyone, male and female, and for any age. They launched a men's collection recently. They're also engagement ring specialists, and I can definitely vouch for them here as they did make mine, which was amazing. Visit their website or go over to their Instagram page and have a look. Great quality and very affordable, but they also offer bespoke jewelry, as I mentioned, engagement rings and other diamond gifts. On their website, you'll see a member box that you can purchase for £20 for the year, which gives you one year's worth of free next day delivery and 10% off everything over £50. Even better, all the Money Game listeners can get a 15% off everything online using the code MONEY15, all in capitals. Don't play games with your jewellery, get it from somewhere trusted. So we were talking about this before with the girls. They were saying, um, well, the one question they wanted me to ask is about imposter syndrome. And is that something that you get? Okay. Do you want to talk about that now? Yeah, because it's the okay. same. Like you got thrown in, right? Okay, yeah, you got thrown in at the deep end, and I just had to do it. I had no choice. Imposter syndrome. Sometimes I actually still get that to this day. Yeah. Um. Sometimes I'll be sitting there, and someone will ask me a question. What are you good at? And I'm like, <laughs> I don't know. Where is your talent? I don't. I actually, I haven't got an answer to that. Yeah. Yet, but I don't think I've got one. Mm-hmm. Um, I can do a backwards roll if that's any good. <laughs> well, it's not about it's not about being a talent at all. Sometimes I think. I can actually sit there and think, I'll be sitting in my house and sometimes I look around and I think, how the fuck did I get this? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I don't know. If someone else done it, I'd be able to tell you exactly what they've done and praise them mm-hmm. and everything. But when it's yourself, I don't think that we give ourselves enough credit yeah. and we don't pat ourselves on the back. Enough. A lot of it's more natural, isn't it? It's not as calculated as, as maybe you'd like it to be. Life isn't like... Yeah. Like that is it. You don't know. As an entrepreneur, you literally don't know what you're going to get up to the next day. Yeah. Um. Some days are good. Some days are bad. Some days are terrible. You just literally don't know, but you just roll with it. Yeah. And sometimes at the end of the week, I think, how does I just get through that week? Like mm-hmm. a million things can happen. But getting back to the imposter syndrome, it's normal. Everybody has it. Doesn't matter where you are in your career. We all get it. And do you know what you do? You learn to deal with that, and you're like, I'm going a minute. I. I know who I am. I remember yeah. who I am. It doesn't matter if I've got a hundred talents or I've got ten. I, I do what I do when I get where I am. Yeah. And you'd have to push it out your head and eradicate it and love yourself. Mm. So, uh, how long before you took over? Before, sorry, how long before you got employed as an elf? And then <laughs> um, from then to taking over? Four years. Four years. Yeah. All right. So, so you've been around it quite. So it was the biggest brick building in the world. Um, it was. Uh, the biggest market in the northwest of England. Yeah, when I took over it, it had <clears throat> it had gone down. It had about seventy eight stalls. I got it back up to six hundred. I opened a nightclub there. I had it. I had Sherlock Holmes film there. I had Captain America film in there. So, you're just winging it right now, right? Yeah, I still don't know what I'm fucking doing <laughs> right now. Um, you know, I've got Jude Law walking past me window in my office. It was really surreal. We had some massive Hollyoaks were always there filming. Yeah. There was just so much going on. So it turned it into a hub, um, a business hub, really, as well. Mm-hmm. So people had offices, people had workspace there. Yeah, and I smashed it, to be honest. Yeah, but I, I know I know. it's obviously they were selling um, those like fake clothes there, right? That was kind of what the markets were. Yeah. But then that that you lost that. And then, I had to get then rid went, of it. Yeah, then you went to the, the film production company, right? Yeah. But what made you make that decision? How, why did you think, okay, let me let me try and do it that way? So again... Because you could have lost it there, couldn't you? If you had nothing coming in or no business there. No, because what happened was so Liverpool 1 was getting built. Um, 
and all the designers that gave Liverpool City Council money to eradicate counterfeit goods mm -hmm. in Liverpool. Because uh, all the shops were coming in. Yeah. Were coming right. And the heritage market was that I never, I wasn't in control of it at that time, but it was the biggest hub, you know, the way the one by um, the jail is in Manchester now. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. mean, that was the heritage. Um, and it was just, it was inundated with it. There were, uh, most stalls were, and they were like, if you, if you don't get rid of it, we're going to do you some money laundering because you're taking money from proceeds of crime. And I actually got that when I took over and I was like, right, well, that's it. And I got threatened and everything. Like, it was a big business. Like, it was as much money involved as there is in drugs, more so. Yeah. Like, some people, it's open. Like, nine o'clock in the morning, by quarter past nine, they took 40 grand. It was just yeah. off the scale. Jeez. So, yeah, so then what, what made you, when you lost that and they obviously got taken out, what made you kind of pivot into because this, production oh it's into production oh so once all the counterfeit traders are gone i'll just go back to this first once all the counterfeit traders are gone the normal storeholders had it flourished because yeah. they weren't competing with you know something that's getting sold for a fiver that's like 200 pounds so people all wanted it and then i, I done loads of schemes where if you were a woman with business you could come down and have a free stall help your mm -hmm. mentor yeah so i got normal stall loads of state and encouraged entrepreneurs to follow the dream because they didn't have the responsibility of having to have a shop with rates and leases right. and everything else you just literally come set your stuff up and you could go home so that went thriving and then the production side of it um we were getting phone calls all the time for advertising um and we had this unique building and I had a challenge of looking and saying, we're only utilizing this space one day a week, seven days in the week. I've mm -hmm. got to find ways of making money. And then we done, we invited all the production. We went onto the Liverpool Film Office website and put like advertisements out saying, we're inviting you for an open day. And we got loads of production companies down, showed them the space, showed them what we could do because it was yeah. secure as well. And then from there, they just flooded in. Yeah. So this is this where you like started making real money? Yeah. Yeah. And how, how was life for you then? You had the one the one kid? One kid. It was the dream, to be honest. Was it? Was she just going to school when you was working? Like... She went to school. She was jail. Do you know what? I had too much too young. I was yeah. going from a council estate having nothing to all of a sudden in footballers' wages. Mm. Like, it was... It was... And it's liberal, to be honest. Like... It's like giving a kid a bag of sweets to eat that much. They well, make just themselves buy them just shopping, sick. like clothes and that. Oh, me, mate. Silliness, <laughs> yeah. Just absolutely. I look back now and think, but you know what? I'm glad. I'm glad I've done it. And I'm glad. And I don't regret anything, yeah. to be honest. Um, but yeah, I was like a kid in a sweet shop and made myself sick. I just, just yeah. spent so much money. But did you did you feel confident, like financially then, in terms of like, even if you blew it, you knew you could make more? Did you feel skilled? I, I have I've always felt like that. Like Have you? literally. You can take everything off me tomorrow, and I know I can make money again. I just can. So I'm never, never like fearful of, oh, God. Yeah. No, it doesn't bother me. And do you know what? As I've got older, money is not that, money doesn't really bother me. It's more of the adrenaline rush with me. That's what I love. Well, That's what I chase. It. Yeah. And like doing deals and making yeah, things yeah, happen. Yeah. That's where I thrive on now. Where, Money's just money, isn't it? Like, comes, goes. You just see it going around in circles. It's not even real anymore. It's not tangible just, anymore, yeah, is it? Yeah, yeah. It's numbers um, on the screen, isn't it? Yeah. I still like to see numbers, but at the same time, that's not what drives me anymore. Mm. Well, what, was that something that dro drove you, like, a lot? Back in the day? Absolutely, yeah. Just... Pound, shillings, pence. to count every <laughs> one of them. Absolutely, totally money-driven. Yeah. But how financially educated were you? Did you make any good, like, good investments? Did you buy yeah, houses I at did, the time? Yeah, I did. I did. I invested some. Like, yes... But knowing now what if I would have known then what I know now, would I I've i would just I'd be off the scale now, Kev. Like literally, yeah. It's like I've, double, triple what yeah, you're worth now. Probably about twenty times. Would you have done different? Being more being more savvy, being more careful on pe the people who I had around me. You mm -hmm. know, I had loads of hangers on, loads yeah. of idiots and um invested better and just be more clever, really, and just not be... I was a gobshite, if mm. the truth be told. Just not be a gobshite. Yeah, cool. So then what came after the uh, the heritage? Pubs. Yeah. Okay. So I invested in pubs, but more so I invested in them because of the land that come with them. So when Wait, you, how, sorry, how did you, how did you um, come out of the heritage? 
I was and did you come out there well? Did you come out there with yeah. good money? So what happened was the site was earmarked for redevelopment. And at the time, Liverpool City Council had said, you know, we need this investment in the city, Cape, blah, blah, blah. We'll relocate, yeah. yeah. And then I found another location and got... Met, oh, it was terrible. So as, you know, we put in for our plan and permission, got told it was passed for approval that we were going to get it. And at the 11th hour, they pulled the plug on us. And I had all these traders like, with nowhere to sure. go. Yeah. So that was traumatizing. Um, and I was just like, you know what? It's done. I'm moving on to something else now. Mm -hmm. Why pubs? Because at the time, they were getting sold off and they had lands with them. So okay. you were buying something with a with going concern on that made money. But at the same time, you'd had the redevelopment opportunity with it as well. Yeah. So it was buying them, letting them run. And then probably after a couple of years, you've got your money back, what you pay for them, but you were left right. with the, the asset. And obviously at this time, you had nothing, you had no property knowledge. Yeah. Not, but you did. Yeah. I am self-taught on everything. I haven't gone to on any courses or anything like that. <laughs> it's just like, literally, it's just your common sense. Yeah. And having confidence. That that is what the whole the whole thing is. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'd already been doing property buying and selling, doing up da 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 da. Um, and I was looking, I was thinking, okay. And some of them are picked up really cheap. And some of them have been just sold off mm -hmm. now. Um yeah, I'd done that and then I had three kids in 12 months, the normal thing to do. And I think I worked right up until the day. I had the twins. I was filming a new show for Channel 4. And like the camera crew was filming me leaving the house with my bags at this massive belly, ready to explode. Yeah. And then had the kids and then just went straight back to work and bought the Sanzu. How, how would you position all that? Like three, three kids all under the age of like one. I don't know. With everything. But how did you like position your days? It might, you must have had some sort of strategy or... You couldn't be winging it every day, like fucking wing it, honestly. <laughs> no, you got like, like childcare. No, I didn't. You know what I mean? No, literally. I mean, I had sometimes I'd have the three, three kids in car seats at work with me. Oh, is it? Um, yeah, I didn't really have much help at the time. They'd go to nursery. I'd have to run back and forth. I, like loads of people ask me, "Case, how do you do it?" And and on my ass, I don't know. I literally mm. do not know. It's all a blur, and I don't know how we do it. But that's another thing about just having to do it and being through in at the deep end as well. Yeah. You just do it. It's your natural instinct to do it. It's not, I don't sit down with a strategy and go, right, I'm going to do this, that's this, that, because it doesn't work out, mm. especially not when your life's so up the wall. So yeah, I just literally do it. I'd be up with my fees, the kids would be vomiting on me. I'd be like, oh God. Um, and then I'd drop them off at nursery, go to work, get as much done in that time that I could, always be on my phone. But it is, yeah, just purely getting through in at the deep end and going, you have no choice. It's either sink or swim, isn't it? Yeah. But I mean, at that time though, you you was, you was made good money. So it wasn't like you was like fighting for finances. No, it wasn't. But at the same time, I've worked since I was 13. So that's just all, all you knew. You knew so you just had to work. I knew. And yeah. even now, like everyone goes, are you going to start to let them down? No, I'm not. I think mm. if I slowed down, I'd probably be on me lazies on my way to die and I think mm. because I've worked my whole life and I enjoy it like lockdown for me was horrific I had a bit of a breakdown wow. because my whole life I've run around and I'm, I'm supposed to be here I'm, I'm in Manchester I'm in London da, 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 phone ringing I'm always 20 minutes behind mm -hmm. and to go from that to nothing was just bizarre like really? I'd just finished it I'd just finished the development on the hotel. So we just opened the hotel, we made it up, Liverpool was smashing it. And then it was just like nothing. And then my children still went to school as well. So I literally had nothing to do. I was just sitting there like, this has never happened before. And my brain couldn't deal with it. Mm. And I think I had a bit of a breakdown because I could, literally couldn't get out of the bed. Yeah. Um, how, how did you get over that? I just had to jack myself out of it like a year I used to. Um, just little by little. And I've learned over the years as well to listen to my body. Some days I can literally get up and get out. My body goes, oh, I can't do today. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case and you can't, then you can't. We're, we're entrepreneurs because we call our own shots. Yeah. We haven't got nine to five jobs and we don't have to be in or phone in sick. So if some days I need a day off, I, I will take a day off and watch Netflix and eat shit in bed and 
just have a day to myself. And then the next day when I go back into work, I'm so much more refreshed and recharged. Yeah. So yeah, I think it's a big part to listen to your body and what it's telling you. Yeah. Well. How, was, how, was, how was business for you locked down? Because you're seeing the, um, like the um, events, right? And hospitality. So the, hospitality, the biggest hit. hospitality side of things was like, it was not. And the way that the hospitality sector was treated throughout that pandemic yeah. was absolutely disgusting. And I'll touch on that in a minute. I had so many arguments on news channels about yeah. it. We had uh, Sasha Lord on here. Sasha Lord, he does uh, Park Life, owner of Park Life. Mm -hmm. And uh, does hospitality as well. He was saying the same. Yeah, it's, it was horrendous. It was re like really bad. But then at the same time, after like the first couple of months, I got back to work with Vitality Homes. I've done a couple of contracts with the MOJ. Mm -hmm. Um, so I still worked. I just thought like it was the first two months when it didn't that I just had like a major breakdown. But yeah, hospitality sector was absolutely awful throughout the whole. Yeah. Of you that. lose a lot of money. Fortune, don't Did forget, you? Liverpool won the league, and I couldn't open the doors. Oh shit, that was the shit. same year. Yeah, so I'm watching it from um, I'm watching it on the television, and I had to turn it off because I had tears run down. I think my till should be. <laughs> jumping money out of them <laughs> so that was heartbreaking the first time they'd won the league in so long and our doors were shut it was heartbreaking yeah no that is like no lot. fans were in the stadium it was just really so that was like the. I think that was the nail in the coffin to be honest I was just like um, but yeah I went back to work I was working with right, working with my other company Vitality Homes we were open the hotel and give it to people who were had nowhere to live because mm -hmm. I was like I can't sit here and have a hotel empty with beds and people not have anywhere to live yeah so I just let people stay in there um and then after after being away from hospitality for so long and going back in once we'd reopened I went back in and thought what the hell am I doing I don't enjoy this anymore so I put the sand enough for sale and then um I had a number of offers for it and it turned them down and turned them down and turned them down and in the end the estate agent said you don't want to sell this do you and I went no no why did, why, why did you think you did well why did you think you did because coming away from it and then going straight back in you just realize how bizarre and right. fast it is when you haven't done something for so long and you're having five thousand people coming to the venue the hotel is full you're doing the hospitality for lfc mm -hmm. the staff everywhere staff phoning sit after the pandemic like getting hold of staff was just a nightmare yeah like you just couldn't get them i was like oh you know what fuck this this is easy ways mm. to work and then as i slowly got back used to it um i was like oh it's not so bad <laughs> <laughs> yeah but you, so you managed to keep everything open right you didn't have to close you didn't have to um get rid of anything sell anything no no make anyone redundant and how are you talking about that no. which is um Absolutely. Now everyone who worked for me come back to work if they wish to. Some did get other jobs during yeah. the pandemic and that was fine. I totally understand that because I couldn't have sat up on the house. If I was an employee, there's yeah. no way I could have sat in the house on furlough. That was just not something I could do. So I totally understand that, wish them well and said, you know, if you do decide to come back, your job's there for you. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, we were all fine. We were good. Yeah. What's your, um, what's your kind of main thing at the minute? What do you spend most of your time doing? Shopping. Other than that, um, <laughs> we'll touch on that know, after. Do you know, it's, um, and I'm taking the piss, by the way, um, I spread it between different things. So I could be on a building project, I could be with Vitality Homes, I could be with the Sanden. I try and spread myself around and then I'm looking at, as an entrepreneur as well, you're always looking at new things yeah. all the time. So I'll be in bed and can't sleep. I'm writing down ideas for new businesses. It's like, you never stop, you never switch off. Um, have, you, have you had a lot of failures? Yeah. In terms of like starting businesses and not working and just closing them down. Failures today. No, do you know what? I've never had to liquidate a company. Yeah, something like that. One thing mean, yeah. I've never ever had to do. I've had ideas and they don't work. Mm. Um, even now, sometimes I'll do something and I think, oh, that shit. <laughs> you know, uh, but th that's about trying. It's about having the yeah. resilience to dust yourself off and try again and not just go, oh, it didn't work. I'm never doing anything again. You have to say, well, so what? Mm. Crack on to the next one. Let's hope that works. And if it doesn't, so what again? Yeah, yeah. Was, was Vitality Homes the first um, insight for you into property? No. What did you do? Did the you Vitality do Homes is supported accommodation for people who suffer from drink and drug addiction or... Of you buy a place or do you build them for them? 
for vice well it depends yeah, on both. Um, redevelop i haven't actually built anyway oh yeah i have actually i built 10 flats 10 studio apartments so yeah i did i don't even know what a fucking name to be honest um and they yeah. cancel fund them right obviously fund it right now so that's another freaking story so a lot of people in my family had suffered with addiction and right. have seen what it can cause. So I had this idea that I knew something needed to be done. So the council pay housing benefit and then I pay the rest. But housing benefit is like the minimal right. amount. So it ends up costing me a fortune, but hey-ho. Um, so you fund it? I probably 40% fund it, yeah. Yeah, oh, so, all right. So, so it's not actually business, like a passion it's project. It's yeah, 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 yeah. It's a non-for-profit organization, but also as well, like some of the success stories that we've had out of there is just really phenomenal. Like people, in terms of people going in there, building their lives back up and then... Yeah. Like someone, there's a story, a lad had gone in the woods with a piece of rope to hang himself. And as he was tying it around, this sounds surreal, but it's actually true. Right. It, it was in the papers and stuff. And as he was tying the rope around the tree, he got a phone call to say, there's a bed for you in Vitality Homes. And he came to us. He was with us for 18 months. He's back in touch with his family. He's got his own place. He's running on his own business. So sometimes, as I said to you before, as you get older, money's not everything. Mm -hmm. And to be able to help another human being on the planet is worth much more than me going shopping or me having money in the bank. Yeah, that's crazy. And you get you get quite a few of those, those, well, kind, of, those kind of stories. Yeah, yeah. Don't mm. get me wrong, some of them, some people can't be helped. Yeah, of Like course. literally yeah. you try, you can take the, there's a true saying, you can take the horse to water, but you can't make it drink yeah. it. But yeah, if these people want to be helped, there's some amazing stories out there and anyone can change, anybody can, it doesn't matter if it's your 10th chance, mm -hmm. you know, everybody can change, but you've got to want to, you've got to want to change. Yeah, yeah. I really hope you're enjoying the show. I would just like to ask for one minute of your time to tell you about my sponsor who support makes the show possible, CPC Finance. CPC Finance is a finance broker that specializes in sourcing and packaging a wide range of property funding. You name it, from buy to let to commercial properties, auction investments, property developments. They are everything you'd want as a finance broker working for you on your property deal. They're extremely experienced. They know their market extremely well, which means they can move quickly. They're on the ball. They've been in the game for 30 years, which has enabled them to, one, build very strong relationships with a variety of lenders, which as an investor is super important, especially when things don't go to plan. Deals in certain situations aren't straightforward, which is often the case they are bespoke specialists. And two, they have a brilliant understanding of all types of property investing. They know the strategies, they understand deal structures. There isn't anything these guys haven't seen, you know, they're seasoned pros. So if you're someone looking for property finance of any kind, go to cpcfinance.co.uk and on the homepage, you can schedule in a call at whatever time or day suits. So what you got going on at the minute? Anything new? Anything coming up? Any other businesses that you haven't mentioned? Um. I might be moving away for a little bit. Where, abroad? Yeah. Would you move abroad? No. Fully? I, no. No. I'd miss things like the chippy and stuff. So <laughs> I have done it before. And like, um, I, I moved for a little bit and I'd done, I think I'd done nine weeks and I was like, fuck this, I'm going home. Yeah. I'm a home bed. Mm. I do like Where did you go? Space. I was in Cyprus. Okay. Yeah. I was just like, no. So you, you and the kids? No, I didn't have the children. Then I just had Caitlin. Okay. Um. And I've worked down in London and been away from home. Like the UK, I'm fine, but I haven't worked on my house. So it just makes sense for me to go and do, I've got a project that needs doing, so I might as well go live there while my house is getting done. Mm. Um, I don't know what's happening tomorrow, to be honest. I just literally... He's on the limb like that. <laughs> yeah, like literally. I, there's no way you're planning, as an entrepreneur... Anyone who says that they know what they're doing for the next 12 months and the diary's a liar. Yeah, not 12 months, yeah, definitely not. Like, literally. But how far does yours go right now? So my, you mine's, should have there. Mine's booked off for the next two months. Okay. But things change. Yeah, Something yeah. could come up tomorrow that's vastly more important than them and I might have to cancel them and move them or something else could happen here. You just don't know what's going to happen in that day and you have to prioritize things and say okay that takes priority over that do I really need to do that can I take that out of the diary and move it to mm -hmm. somewhere else so it's just juggling yeah. I think a question people would have with that is um anxiety do you get much anxiety about that anxiety yeah so I do suffer from anxiety I suffer from depression as well um, okay so if I have anxiety like this morning 
I was bombarded like from eight o'clock this morning in the morning because my children get dropped off at school at eight. And from that minute, I was having that many phone calls that my anxiety was literally through the roof. Mm-hmm. So I was like, I could feel like I was choking on it or someone was sitting on my chest. So I just take 10 minutes. I put a little meditation on and I'll just clear my mind. And then I visualize blowing all of that negative feeling out of my body. So when you're blowing out, I can feel I'm, all the tension and everything in my chest. Really I, so. I exhale it and get it out and reset. It's just like pushing a reset button on me. Is that, is that something that you do with, you've dealt with for a long time? I've said, oh, yeah, I've had to always deal with anxiety. Um, and you, you just learn to, you learn tips and tactics the how tools to get to kind of it. Yeah. Work with it. Yeah. Yeah. Is that, um, would you say that's, that's helped you at all with business? Just the fact that of having anxiety in order to kind of get rid of it or make you stronger, make a, make you a better person, be able to deal with the, like the hecticness of life. I love the hecticness of life. I think yeah. I'm addicted to it. Like I actually love it. If something, everything's plain sailing. I and it's too quiet, it's a bit. I'm, it's I'm like, oh, this is <laughs> shit. Uh, unless it's chaotic. That yeah. is when I thrive. I am mm. a problem solver. I think on my feet. Um, and I keep referring to this, but getting through in at the deep end is the best thing that can ever happen to me. It's just, I love a challenge. I love new businesses. I love going in there. I help people as well with their businesses. And yeah, yeah anything that's new and anything that challenges me, I absolutely love. Mm. What's your kids' response to like what you do? What do they think of it? I just, they, they think I'm a bank. <laughs> you know, I might as well just like tap the pin in, I spit money out. <laughs> um, they're only babies. I mean, my daughter has got, my eldest daughter, she's 23 and literally doesn't ask for nothing. Mm. Literally, like she's not into designer clothes. She's not one bit bothered. She'll go to Primark and get herself a few bits. She works for her money. It's very rare she asks me for anything because she's like, well, I want to do it myself. I don't want it to be, oh, you got this because of your mum or yeah. you know, you got it because of your mum. She's like, I want to do it for, for myself, mum. Where do you think she got that from? Because I brought her up to value money and, you know, she had to earn it. So Mm -hmm. she'd have to do jobs around the house or, and she's seen how hard I worked. And sometimes I'd come in and be exhausted Mm. and she'd be like, mum, you know, and she knew I only done it for her. So yeah, she's like, she's strong. She's independent. She's, I'm so proud of her. Like she's just done a degree in media. She wants, she's doing, she's working in solicitors right now. She's going on to do a law degree because she wants to be a media lawyer. So, and then I've got three little bastards, but please God, I'm hoping they change. <laughs> the uh, the boys into football too. Yeah. So me, you know, one of my twins, um, he's got ADHD and he can recite every single player in the Premier League, the numbers, the position they play. Every it's, team? Every team. Yeah, he's also on my Instagram. He goes on my Instagram and he'll be like, um, did it? I don't even know anyone's names, by the way. I own like right. the birthplace of LFC and I only know him. Um, <laughs> the Egyptian king, that's, that's all I know. <laughs> um, and he's like, yes, yeah, this quarterback and this quarterback. Oh, America. Yeah, that's, whatever, that's, that's NFL. <laughs> whatever the calls, whatever they play. And he just recites them all. Um, that's crazy. The other lad, he plays, see, the one who can recite it all, he plays rugby. All right, okay, cool. Um, but the me other lads, he plays football. And I just, you know what? I don't push my kids. I'm not one of them competitive mm. mothers, like pushing my kids. It's like, you know what? Enjoy it. Do yeah. you like it? Yeah, go and do it. You know, you yeah. haven't got to be the best at something. As long as you enjoy it, enjoy it. And as long as they're not sitting on these bloody games and iPads and stuff and they're mm. actually getting exercise, I'm happy. Yeah. So obviously you, when you were younger, you went to school, you hated school, right? You thought it was irrelevant. Mm. You're not a big fan of school. How, how do you kind of... Deal with your kids in terms of that respect. So oh, they God. go to school, right? Absolutely. They go, they go to private school? Yeah. So is, is, that, is been, that any better? So they've all been in private school. Caitlin went right through private school. She went to college, university. Yeah. Amazing. Um, then three, you know, I go to the school and it's it's like one of the best, it is the best school mm. in the Northwest. Um, and I go in the school and they're like, oh, the kids are amazing. They're angels. I'm like... <laughs> yeah. fucking crack but they are actually good in school right. it's just for me and I've invested in them because I am a firm believer and I, I make people might disagree with this but I know myself if I go and I'm doing interviews and I look on the form and I see that they've been in private school and they've yeah. been invested in I know I'm hard um, yeah. and the smaller classes so they get more attention as well they're not through in like a class and the teacher's trying running around everywhere mm. they're more attentive they have better 
you know, extra curriculum activities on. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you're, you're, you're way more impressed from what you remember school being like. I'm a school shit out. Where is he? Yeah. They knocked down him. <laughs> <That's> actually. <laughs> All right, cool. We're gonna I'm gonna wrap this up with a quick um quick fire round for you. Okay. Just a few little questions to get get your take on something. Um, what would you say is your biggest risk taken in business? Putting all my eggs in one basket at one time. Like so, I've when was that? With the heritage market, I put everything into it, every last pound I had, and it pays off. But it, you've got to be a risk taker. I've put, I've, I've lost. I've took risks and lost. Yeah. After yeah. you taken, after you took it over. Yeah. You injected loads of all your yeah. money into it. Yeah. Really? I've took advertising campaigns, sponsoring Radio City, giving holidays away, loads of yeah, you know, loads of marketing and stuff. And if it would have went tits up, I'd have been fucked. Back you literally went, went to zero on it. Yeah, I would have been back in my me, me ma's house on it. <laughs> or so. But yeah. Um, How long did it take to pay off until you started seeing returns on it? About six months. Okay, cool. Um, but you've got to take risks, like literally always take risks. Mm -hmm. What was um, your biggest win in business? One thing, one that stands out? Probably doing the deal for the Sherlock Holmes film. Like it was six figures for Sick. like a a couple of weeks. So I cheese. Mm. Um what are your top tips, top advice for women in business? Top tips for women in business. Appreciate yourself, know your worth, know that you're powerful. Never feel inferior to anybody. Go into every single meeting like you own it. Just be a boss bitch. <laughs> Nice, I like it. Um, you talk about you spoke about shopping a lot, so I'm going to ask you: What's your most expensive purchase? What are you wearing? Are oh, you watch? Do you mean clothes? Uh, no, anything um, from shopping. Jewelry, clothes. I've got. I've had to take. Two yeah, but the one most expensive, oh, expensive what? purchase. I don't want to say the least because I don't. All right, tell me after. <sighs> if you could. I uh, spin a wheel, right? It's got loads of different industries. If I had what? I'm gonna sp if let's say I had an imaginary wheel, yeah. had loads of different industries, mm -hmm. property development, or whatever, everything. Mm -hmm. You can't choose, just whatever it lands on. And you have to take that company to like a billion. Yeah. And you can choose one business partner. Anyone, you don't have to know him, anyone. Who would you choose? What a weird question. <laughs> yeah, it is what it is. <laughs> Uh, and she's got to be a woman as well. I was going to be a woman. Yeah. Oh, but I take cheap my Charlotte's on a Hugh with me. Charlotte? Yeah. No, this Charlotte. Charlotte's a great businesswoman. I'm talking about anyone in the whole world. I said, what? I don't get it. Okay. A random business. What I'm saying is, right. if I say property development, then yeah, you can pick right. someone who's using property in development. The, yeah. So I'm trying to find an all rounder. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> um, Karen Brazy. I don't know who that is. Who's that? She's this big, strong, powerful business. <laughs> Okay, cool. Uh, last question. Who had the biggest influence in you in business? Me. I'm me. Do you know, want to know the truth of that? Yeah, go on. Um, me daughter. She was the absolute drive and the biggest influence. I've never gone to seminars. I've never been influenced by anyone in business. I've done it on my own. Um, Self-taught. Yeah. With but, the drive of looking after your daughter? With the drive of giving her a better life. That yeah. was the, being the biggest influence. If I probably wouldn't have had her, I'd probably be partying on some beach somewhere. Really? Um, but yeah, she's been the biggest influence in business and also the utility companies who I have to give fucking millions to. <laughs> I have one more. Your core, your core philosophy for life and business. What you go by? I go by fake it till you make it. <laughs> Like literally, okay. I have always, I will never go in a room and let someone know I don't know what I'm talking about. I'll blag it. Just blag it. Blag it, <laughs> come away and deal with it later. That is I it. Don't that. ever go in and just don't say no to nothing. Don't go in and be like, oh no, I can't do that. Don't let, everyone, don't ever let anyone see your weaknesses. Go in, say yeah, nod and say, yep, that's fine. Yeah, I'll get that done. Come out and think, shit, how the fuck am I going to do this? <laughs> and just then work you it just out. find a way. Yeah, yeah that's it. There's actually there's a, there's a famous Richard Branson quote about that. I can't remember what it is. But it's exactly what you said. Mm -hmm. That's it. Oh, I love that. Thanks so much. That was amazing. Thanks. Thank you.